I started this channel on a whim about five months ago. Going into this, I literally thought there were barely any other female narrators and that I would be alone. As I continued, I not only made so many wonderful friends in the horror narration community, I came to find that there were actually many other female narrators. At around 30 or so subscribers, I said to myself, if I ever hit 1,000 subscribers, I want to bring as many female narrators together as I can for a collaboration. Back then, reaching 1,000 subscribers was just a dream. Yet here I am today, only five months later at over 1,300 subscribers, with over 20 female narrators who came together to help make my vision possible. I want to thank each and every female narrator who was on this collaboration. Whether you submitted a story to share from your channel, narrated a new story, or submitted an original story you wrote yourself, I am eternally grateful to have you be a part of this. Sometimes the path you start out on isn't the one you wind up taking. I am so happy I veered off the path and wound up here. I never thought I would come to love something so much or make so many new friends. I've never been good at many things in my life, so to think that maybe, just maybe I could be good at this, is life-changing. To everyone I've come in contact with in this community, and to all of the lovely ladies on this collaboration, thank you. Thank you for 1,000 subscribers. Thank you for your overwhelming support. Thank you for everything. Thank you with my whole heart. I always wish there was a better way to say thank you because in this instance, thank you just doesn't seem like enough. I wouldn't be anywhere without all of you. I, I really mean that I would not be anywhere without all of your overwhelming support that I have received since I started. Now, without further ado, I present to you the all-female collaboration. Let's get creepy. I was always pretty normal. People loved me. From babies to elderly people, I knew how to appeal to everyone. I was pretty smart, straight A's, and perfect attendance until middle school. Then it all just kind of turned around. I was failing math, and I finally got up to a B. I felt myself slowly changing into the monster I am today. I wasn't failing because I was stupid. I was failing because I was bored. I would take my class time to draw or write small stories. Then come ninth grade and I seriously fail everything. That's right, everything. Even gym. I dropped out after that and started doing homeschooling. Quit that after my mom died. I slowly started to spiral downward after that, drinking, smoking so many cigarettes I'm surprised my lungs didn't just collapse. I didn't really know what was happening to me, and my dad was too busy with his own misery to worry about me. Now, I would blame my mother's death for my downfall, but I know that's not it. I've always deep down been this way, just cold and calculated to get what I want. The slight smile, the compliments, I never did anything if I didn't get anything out of it, even as a child. By the time I spiraled into complete madness, mostly everyone who ever liked me forgot I existed. And that's what makes this so perfect. My first victim was just some girl walking alone on a back road. I'm not really sure what made me do it, but I picked her up in my car. I told her I'd take her back to the house she shared with her boyfriend. They had gotten in a fight. You know, men. I guess she trusted me because I was a woman too. But the gasp and gurgle noise she made when I stabbed her in the chest and the look on her pretty little face as the blood dripped out was priceless. She was gorgeous. Now she's not. With her bleach blonde hair now shaved off and her rotting body in the woods? It's been there three months and I've had two more victims since then. The second victim was some guy at a bar who obviously had too many drinks and was just looking for someone before last call, which I happily obliged. All I had to say was yes and he took me back to his house, 
which was really nice, honestly. If all I wanted was cash grab, this would be the place, but unfortunately for him, I was not there to rob him. I grabbed a vase and shattered it over his head, knocking him out. He woke up being tied to a table. He tried to scream, but he was gagged. I looked at the fear in his eyes as he looked down and saw the bowl. Then he felt their tiny little feet on his stomach, and I think that's when it hit him. I started burning the charcoal, and the screams as the rats ate through him was music to my ears. I threw his body in the woods the next town over. The third, I basically just picked up some poor drunk girl and said I was the uber she called. The sounds her throat made as I crushed it with all the strength I had in me made me the happiest person alive. Then, she stopped struggling and her body became limp and eventually cold to the touch. I took her home with me dyed her hair the ugliest color I saw on the shelf, and then I dressed her up in raggedy clothes and I posed her body outside of a crack house. Now, so far, my victims are just unsuspecting guys at bars. Others are people walking on the streets at night. No victim is the same and there is no pattern. No one will ever see it coming, and no one will ever be safe. I feel the urge coming again. It's all I think about. You might want to tell your loved ones to stay inside at night. You won't know where I am or who I'll be in the mood for hunting. Today, they finally found my first victim. Let the panic begin. I tried to be normal, but I love this feeling. Just like everyone loved me. Whistle is considered one of the happiest sounds on earth by many. I am not one of those people. I hate the sound of whistling. Another thing I hate is the tune of Oh Susanna. I can't bear to hear the two combined. Not after that night. It started on the night before my final. I was only in high school and I was trying to pull an all-nighter to study for it. While studying, I began to whistle absentmindedly. It started with just random notes, nothing too advanced. Then slowly, I began whistling melodies that were familiar to me. Pop Goes the Weasel, Ring Around the Rosies, and finally, Oh Susanna. While whistling, I heard the same tune being whistled behind me. I turned around quickly to the sight of nothing. I continued studying, thinking it was just my imagination, and again I began whistling, picking up where I'd left off. My lips soon got tired, so I started to hum. But to my absolute horror, the whistling started up again. I turned around again, afraid for my own sanity, but this time I saw a shadow on my wall. I thought nothing of it at the time and turned back to my studies. A scream I could not control escaped my throat. In front of me was a shadow. My shadow. I turned around hoping to see nothing, but to my dismay, the shadow seemed darker. The whistling picked back up and the shadow seemed to become solid. I backed up as the faceless thing began to gain features. A logo slowly molded itself into the thing's torso. Eyes, ears, hair. A nose and mouth molded themselves into the face. It looked like an exact replica of me. It took a step towards me and I blacked out. I later awoke and the shadow was nowhere to be seen. Ever since then I have hated the sound of whistling and oh Susanna. But even worse, I've had periods where I black out and wake up with blood on my hands or holding someone's organs, or something horrible. I remember nothing from this but one thing. I remember singing, Oh Susanna. Oh Susanna, 
Mama, don't you cry for me. I was born in Alabama with a banjo on my knee. My sunflower seeds started talking to me last month. I couldn't believe it. I'd been lonely for such a long time. It felt good to have friends. I bet it was my mom who asked them to keep me company. I miss her terribly. The clearest memory I have of mom was when she told me that all the beauty in the world grows from something small. I was helping her in the garden, and we'd just planted sunflowers. My favorite! A couple days later, she showed me the tiny, burgeoning sprouts that would eventually become the towering, yellow flowers I loved so much. She repeated what she told me about beauty. I remember being amazed. I'd wake up every morning and head outside to check their progress. Each time, they were a little bit bigger. Then, there was an accident. A bad one. After that, I didn't have a mom anymore. Dad and I scattered her ashes in the garden, right when the sunflowers were at their most radiant. It took years for me to realize how much mom's death had affected me. I just thought I was a sad person in general, since I'd known the feeling for so long. It didn't cross my mind that I'd been traumatized and might need help beyond basic counseling. By the time I considered it, I was pretty far gone. The sunflower seeds started talking at an important time for me. I'd lost all hope of being happy again. Dad and I didn't speak. I had no friends. I spent all my time alone in my bedroom, wishing I was anywhere else. Anyone else. I'd developed a bad habit of using a pushpin to make small cuts and punctures in my arms and legs. They made me feel just a bit better, but I still cried whenever I did it. On that special day, after a particularly painful cut, I heard the chorus of small voices coming from the table. Don't, Don't be sad. sad! I jumped. I was alone in the house. Dad was working his first shift and still had another one to go. He wouldn't be home for another 14 hours. Again. Don't, Don't be sad! sad. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful day outside! outside. Sad. A tiny package of sunflower seeds sat on the surface of my desk. They were a snack I'd bought on the last day of school. I'd eaten a handful that afternoon and forgotten about them. They'd been sitting there for a week. I wiped my eyes and stood over the desk. Inside the plastic, I could see all the sunflower seeds standing up. Hi, Rachel! I jumped again. The seeds wiggled in their bag, almost like they were waving. Confused curiosity overcame my alarm. I assumed I was going crazy. Sunflower seeds don't talk to sane people, but they were talking to me. There was something comforting about them, too. Something familiar. I felt a wave of bittersweet nostalgia. The sting of the cut on my upper arm brought me back to reality. It was about as deep as the pushpin was long. A thin rivulet of blood drooled down to my elbow. It was so ugly. Almost on cue with the thought, the sunflower seeds began to comfort me. Oh, oh Rachel, Rachel it's, it's not, not ugly. It was, it was just a mistake. mistake. Don't, Don't worry, it will heal, heal and you'll forget, forget all, about all about it. Their kind words were in stark contrast to the wound. Its edges were puffy and red, making it look angry. And it hurt a lot. I didn't know how something so small could be so hideous. From the desk below, the seeds continued their praise and support. Amid the voices and my own considerable confusion and discomfort, an old memory resurfaced, one I'd kept below the surface for over ten years. All the beauty in the world grows from something small. The sentence echoed within my mind, bouncing and twirling and floating, as I considered its meaning and implications. The sunflower seeds watched my contemplation in silence. A minute later, I knew. I reached to pick one up as the rest of them burst into jeers of joy. 
I inspected the seed for a moment, then pushed it into the puncture as far as it would go. A sensation of blissful contentment unlike anything I'd ever experienced suffused through me. My eyes closed. Behind my eyelids, I was four years old again. Mom stood in front of me, beautiful and tall in her shorts and tank top and gardening gloves. Her smile shone down as she spoke her poignant, memorable words and pointed her gloved fingers at the barely visible sprouts pushing out of the nourishing soil. I lifted my eyelids to the sight of a plain, gray seed poking from the raised edges of my puncture wound like an engorged tick. Before I could tell myself how ugly it was, I stopped. I remembered what my mom said. The seeds on the desk cheered louder. Two long, summer days went by. I spoke to the seeds, and they spoke back. We made plans together. We talked about the future. I'd covered the one in my arm with a piece of gauze. On the morning of the third day, the seeds asked me to take off the bandage. I did with trepidation, which turned out to be entirely misplaced. Inside the swollen, wrinkled edges of the puncture, a tiny, fragile sprout lay curled. When the light from the room hit the sprout, it slowly stood. It was indescribably beautiful. Feeling better than I'd ever felt, I stabbed the pin into myself over and over and over. Arms, legs, belly, shoulders. The only tears I shed were ones of happiness. I planted each seed with diligence and care. Days went by. The hundred or so holes in me grew wider as the seeds sprouted and grew. I sat on my bed in front of the window to make sure they got enough sun. I heard Dad come and go from his jobs, leaving food for me without ever knocking her or saying hello. I was grateful. I didn't want to be bothered. Seed-sized holes became fingertip-sized holes. Fingertip-sized holes became quarter-sized holes. They all leaked, and none smelled particularly good. I remembered how Mom had used fertilizer in the garden that smelled terrible, but it was always worth it. I stopped keeping track of the days and only concentrated on the sprouts. They were all healthy and growing, all but the one near my navel. It had turned brown and was wilting. The other sprouts told me it couldn't be saved. I'd have to remove it or else they'd all get sick. I started the process of pulling the foot-long plant out of my abdomen. I felt and heard ripping sounds as the roots were torn from within. The pain was immense. When it was all done, there was a shallow hole in my belly the size of my palm. It was streaked with white and yellow paste that smelled terrible. I spent some time wiping it away. Afterward, all the sprouts thanked me. Another long period passed by. Maybe a month. I woke up today to the first blossom on one of the sprouts. It was the tallest of them all, sticking out almost three feet from my shoulder. All the days leading up to this, I felt excitement. Today, though, I'm too weak to feel anything. It took almost an hour for me to get out of bed. I looked at myself in the mirror. I was home to nearly 80 healthy plants all between one and three feet tall. Root systems under my skin ran in complex patterns, bringing nourishment to the heavy, healthy sunflower stalks. We had a long conversation as I sat, barely able to eat the breakfast that Dad had left for me. We came to an agreement. I'm using the last bit of energy I have to write this. When I'm done, I've agreed to go out and sleep in the garden. I can't believe I spent years feeling sad, feeling ugly, feeling like I didn't have a purpose. Even though Mom died when I was young, she'd told me all I needed to know in one perfect sentence. Now, I'm going to go out and sleep in the same soil she used to bring beauty in the world. The soil where she slept for the last ten years. I get to be with her again, and the world gets a new crop of sunflowers. Beautiful things that grow from something small, just like me.
I never really talk about this experience as I've never felt that many people would believe me if I ever told them the truth. I admit to having hallucinations frequently, and I do admit to hearing voices on occasion, but they were nothing like this. This happened to me about five years ago. Most people don't believe that this is possible, but there is some truth to this experience. People sometimes undergo a condition where they fall into a light sleep, but end up waking up. During this phase, your body freezes itself into a place in a condition known as sleep paralysis. Many people report experiencing this strange phenomenon, whether they're awake during a sleep paralysis, and I was no different. During a night where I had very little sleep, I woke up for some reason, but was incapable of movement. It was the first time I had ever woken up during a sleep paralysis, but it was an experience I surely couldn't forget. At the foot of my bed was a large, dark, humanoid figure. His eyes were a piercing metallic red, its face looked like a rotted and mistreated stuffed animal with razor-sharp teeth. Its body was the color of pure darkness and reflected the light that seeped in through the window. In its left hand, it held a large cleaver knife and slowly spread a wide smile across his hideous face. The figure floated over towards me, its feet never touching the ground. Its grisly maw opened slowly mouthing out the words it had for me carefully. Don't move. Its voice was cold and metallic, almost like the sound of shredding sheet metal. As much as I wanted to flee or cower in fear, I was incapable of movement. I was even incapable of tears. I wanted to cry out to someone, anyone, for help. But what I can only make out were mere whispers. My eyes, however, were fully capable of movement and could clearly see a monster that loomed over me. It lowered its face within just a few inches of mine and had its arm raised with the cleaver in hand just above my head. I wanted to be anywhere, even in the pits of hell, just so I would be free of the suspense of having this hideous entity hovering over me. It spoke to me again. Count to three. I closed my eyes and slowly began to count up to three. I could feel the breath of the figure above my forehead, warm and moist. I sounded off the first number. One. one, one. I readied myself to say two, but I felt the figure's breath coming closer. I wanted anything but to lay in my bed, powerless to this being. Two. 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 I cried out to the monster, and I felt it grow even closer. I opened one of my eyes and gazed deeply into the soulless stare of the entity that was poised on taking my life. Its open mouth was close enough to sink its jagged teeth into my face. It grew impatient, waiting on its kill, and commanded me to continue. Do it. It shouted as I closed my eyes again. I spoke aloud once more. Three. I waited in my bed for five long minutes hoping that it had already killed me and that the suspense was over. It didn't matter to me whether I was in heaven or hell, just as long as it was over. Surprisingly to me that night, it was neither. After I opened my eyes, I realized that I wasn't dead and that I was fully capable of moving again. I never experienced something like that ever since that night. And that night was one of the last nights I had ever had a dream, nightmare, or horrific occurrence such as that. Since then, I've come to the conclusion for myself that the figure was likely a hallucination, made up from my own mind. Some may say that it was a ghost or demon, but I won't deny their claims, but I just can't accept them as a fact. No matter what I saw that night, I hope I never see it again. I'm an 18-year-old girl in high school, and I've been dating this really amazing guy for about five months now. I'm not really sure how we started speaking because, quite honestly, he's one of the weirdest guys at our school. He doesn't have a lot of friends. I actually don't think he talks to anyone but me, and he always sits alone eating the same lunch. 
I'm not sure what his obsession is with BLTs, but he literally has one every day, and after he's done, he puts the wrapper back in his bag. Sometimes I catch him smelling it. It's kind of a weird quirk, but hey, who doesn't love bacon? So I've been dying to meet his parents for months now, but every time I try to, they always seem to have some sort of excuse as to why I can't come over. It's not like we're trying to make plans in the middle of the week, so after a while, I started to feel like they just didn't like me. If he had friends that weren't allowed to go over, I might feel better, but I don't even have that to go off of. But last Wednesday, he finally asked me if I wanted to come over for dinner that Friday. Of course I said yes. I spent the next two days psyching myself up and deciding what I was going to wear, what questions to ask, and how to answer all of their questions. I really wanted to impress them. So, when Friday night finally came, he picked me up around six. I didn't know where he lived or what his house would look like. For some reason, I never thought to ask. I guess I just wanted to be surprised. It took us like 15 minutes to get to his house. I wasn't even sure if we were still in our hometown at first, he lived so far out in the boonies. I don't think I saw a house the entire last five minutes of our trip. Finally though, we pulled into his very long dirt driveway, and at the end of it was a beautiful colonial house. Out back behind the house was a huge barn. I didn't see any farm animals, but it definitely looked like they kept it up. After the last few months of dodging even saying hello to me, I got to meet his parents. I thought they would be stuck up because his house was so well taken care of, and even though they weren't rich, they clearly enjoyed material things. His parents were honestly way more happy to see me than I thought they would be. I'm still not sure why they were so adamant about not having me over before, since they asked me a ton of questions. They wanted to know about my parents, siblings, friends. His mother even asked me about my diet and skincare. At this point, I'm unsure of what to expect for a meal until I see the familiar dish of pork tenderloin, served with Brussels sprouts and potatoes. After just a few bites, it's clear to me that this is a type of pork I've never had before, so I ask his mother how she made this pork. It was a little bitter, but absolutely delicious. When she answered me, I just sort of nodded and said, Oh, but I honestly had never heard of that type of pig before. Does anybody know what a long pig is? I've always loved the dark. It feels warm and welcoming, like a mask, hiding all the stress and emotion that the daylight shows so explicitly, and replacing them with a sensuous feeling. The dark reveals your true nature, and abolishes the facade you play during the daytime. Yes, the dark is good. You could be yourself in the dark and not feel judged or threatened all the while by being yourself. That's why I love the night so much. You can just relax in the blackness, surrounded by nothing but shadow, allowing the dark to overcome your senses and numb them down until you feel nothing at all but complete weightlessness. Then, when sleep finally takes control, you are thrusted into even deeper darkness. Infinite darkness. Just black, empty space. An endless void your mind creates to help you drift off into unconsciousness. But why? Why is it always black? Have you ever thought about that? Whenever we close our eyes, we are met with black. But why? You don't notice it, do you? You don't think about it. It's just there. Like breathing, blinking. After a while, your subconscious just accepts that when we close our eyes, we see darkness. Empty darkness. Why is it then that people are scared of the dark? An average human being will sleep for 229,961 hours of their lifetime. For one whole third of their life, they will live in darkness. Complete and utter darkness. If we really were scared of the dark, why do we have the ability to close our eyes and sleep for so long? So long in the black oblivion. You see, I think no one is truly afraid of the dark. That's just an illusion. An illusion we produce to trick ourselves into thinking that there is no such thing as monsters. We've all heard that story, haven't we? 
about the night terrors that roam around in the night? Claws raised, teeth bared, ready to attack the young, naive child as they sleep in their beds. Unaware of their demonic presence because they can't see them. Don't lie to yourself. You were like that once. Sitting awake, clutching at the sheets as you stare at your ceiling or glancing around your room. Perhaps you had a nightlight, a holy crucifix of sorts, that were used to ward off the monsters, to protect you. Well, I think as you grow up, you begin to tell yourself that in all your childlike innocence, you were never scared of the evil that lurked in the shadows. You were simply afraid of the dark. That's what you believe. As you grow up, you tend to grow out of this fear and relish in the dark like I do. But this fear can remain with you in adulthood. In fact, it's one of the most common phobias, nyctophobia. Even as a fully matured adult, you still fear the emptiness. Or do you? You see, the statistics prove that we spend a long time sleeping, a long time in the dark. We never seem to mind, even if we are terribly scared of that dark. But why? I think our subconscious is telling you. I think your subconscious is telling you that they are still there. And a small part of you still holds strong on your childhood memories of being alone in the dark with the night terrors. But this time, you have no light to guard you. Obviously, adults don't tend to own those little night lights anymore, do they? They say they don't need them anymore. They call it a silly childhood fear of the dark. They say there is no such thing as night terrors. But what do they know? If they lived long enough to mature into adulthood, they've probably never seen one. My opinion is that we all have nyctophilia, a general love for the dark that helps us sleep. Even those that claim they have a fear of the night, they love the dark. I love the dark. You really were never scared of the dark. It really was an illusion our minds created to reassure ourselves we are safe at night. To reassure us that there are no such things as night terrors. I love the dark. I always have. It feels homely, warm, and comforting. Like I've always been in the dark. It's fun being in the dark. Feeling free, feeling safe. I know you like the dark too. When you come home from work, tired and tense, and you flop onto your bed, stretching your aching muscles, getting ready to sleep. Yes, you love the dark. I know. You still fear it, though. An occasional scan around your room before you allow your body to shift into sleep mode. It's amusing, really. You know damn straight what you fear, and it ain't the dark. It's... Me. I like watching you sleep. The way you toss and turn. The way you sigh contently when you get comfortable. The way you jump up in surprise when you hear a noise. You haven't changed much from when you were a child. Not really. You still fear me. But this time, I'm not going to let you get away. You are unprotected now. No nightlight, no nothing. Completely and utterly alone in the dark. With me. I've always loved the dark. So have you. Gross! Don't touch it! Judith whined, recalling as George prodded at the fleshy lamp in the side of the cypress tree with a sharp stick. Little Thomas spoke up from beside her, pointing at the thing excitedly and smiling ear to ear. Look! It's moving! Sure enough, their discovery twitched in response, the fleshy hole in its center slowly beginning to open and close. It was an odd thing, the children knew at least that much. 
From a distance, he had just looked like a flower on a tree, but when they had gotten closer, they had noticed its peculiarities. For one thing, it had a mouth, a fang-filled maw that had seemed dormant up until this experimental stick-poking. That in itself was bizarre, but during the children's inspection of it, they noticed that the throat of the thing on the tree seemed to stretch on for miles. A grotesque tube filled with teeth going on and on longer than it had any right to. This discovery was quickly shoved to the wayside upon closer inspection of the large pink petals the thing had, the mouth hole resting in the middle of what looked like a pile of tongues, each with many wide protrusions. It had been Judith to notice what exactly the white shirts were, human teeth seemingly growing out of the flesh of this meat flower. Judith was cautious of the thing, as she was with everything she did not understand, but George and little Thomas were excited and curious about this new discovery, and there was no way she was walking back through the swamp alone. The boys laughed at the thing, enjoying the spectacle of the hungry maw twitching and burbling, some of the petals lapping at the air, many of the teeth retracting inwards. Every movement it made, Judith took a step back. It just looked wrong. She had always seen the same kinds of plants in the swamp outside the house, and there had never been anything like this in father's flower books. Judith twirled a lock of brown hair in her fingers, as George experimentally put the tip of the branch into the now gnashing gullet, dragging the pudgy, bespectacled child a few steps forward as the stick in his hand was chomped down on and pulled in violently. He shrieked, releasing the stick as the flower devoured it hastily, splinters of wood flying through the air at the force, those many rows of razor-sharp fangs were showing with every bite. Every one of the petal tongues lashed aggressively now, their many tiny teeth jutting out and wiggling violently as it mindlessly consumed the invading object. Little Thomas shrieked loudly, his shrill voice piercing the air and drowning out the sounds of slurping and chomping, Judith and George quickly following suit and taking several steps back, eyes filled with a sudden and immediate terror at the sudden threat to their lives. Judith pouted, straightening her dress before stamping her feet adamantly, shoulder-length brown curls bouncing angrily as she made clear her displeasure. I told you not to touch it, George! I don't like it! I wanna go home! George fixed his glasses, puffing his cheeks out grumpily and giving a pout straight back at the younger female. He folded his arms across his chest. Fine, you big baby! If you're gonna be like that, We'll just leave you behind next time. Yeah, little Thomas piped up, mimicking the pose of the larger boy beside him and giving a sneer in Judith's direction. She blushed red, then stuck her tongue out, taking a seat against another cypress and crossing her arms as well. The situation upset her, but not enough to warrant losing her playmates. George nodded at little Thomas and turned his attention back towards the unusual flower. He rubbed his chin for a moment, pudgy fingers brushing across pale, freckled skin as he considered what to do with their discovery next. It was hardly moving at all, dormant as it had been when they found it. Suddenly, little Thomas had an idea. You wanna throw rocks at it? Good idea! The two boys beamed. 
Judith opened her mouth to speak, then went back to sulking. If they wanted to get themselves hurt, who was she to stop them? They didn't want to listen to her, after all. George and little Thomas dug through the dirt and grabbed the biggest rocks they could find, the larger child rubbing his sweaty hands on his stretched cardigan before taking aim at the flower. The rock loosed with more force than George had expected, bumping against the petals hard enough to leave a bruise on one. The oddity howled in pain, its wails echoing throughout the forest, loud enough to force the children to cover their ears. The teeth covering the creature's tongue petals seemed to bear, dozens of them nearly in danger of digging their way out of the bumpy flaps entirely as they wiggled and squirmed, the flower furious at having been struck. The pink organs flailed and crushed hungrily, slurping Mao jetting out a long black tendril from somewhere in its chasm of a throat and threshing it through the air wildly, desperately searching for whatever attacked it. Little Thomas yelped and threw his rock square at the flower, unable to think of anything else to do. Another gibbering howl sent the birds flying out of the trees, the long, shrill sound bringing Judith and George to their knees, hands covering their ears. The youngest among them was not so lucky, however. His gaze fixed on the black tendril, his ears deafened as he watched it slow flailing, the tip splitting and peeling back to reveal a milky white eye. More dripping tendrils began to form off of the first, each one stretching out several feet before splitting to reveal eyes of their own. The monster's shriek had stopped, but little Thomas could still hear the ringing, two small pops the only indication that the boy's eardrums had broken. His eyes strained on the curious, watching eyes, constantly multiplying as they slithered closer still. George called out to him, he thought, but his voice seemed a million miles away. One of the flower's star-dripping tentacles surged forward, followed by what was now hundreds more, moving as a concentrated mass towards little Thomas's face, the boy's eyes spinning round and round. Many drove down through his mouth, shattering teeth as they filled up his stomach, others filling into his ears, into his eyes. They moved clumsily, dragging him to the ground with some effort before steadily pulling the new meal in closer. Oily tendrils caressed his brain, and both Judith and George screamed in utter horror as they watched their friend smile, tiny hands clawing at the dirt as if trying to get closer to the thing on the tree, his eyes a pure white and his skin pale as death as he desperately flopped himself across the dirt. Sobbing and wailing, George grabbed little Thomas's feet and pulled, his once-polished dress shoes becoming caked in mud and dust as he strained with all his might. The younger boy's legs flailed and kicked in retaliation, gurgling angrily and hugging the cypress's trunk as if it were the most important thing in the world. One of these kicks landed its mark, catching George in the face and shattering one of his lenses, Judith still shrieking and holding her hands over her ears in complete hysterics. Little Thomas's happy burbles grew more frequent as he grew closer and closer to the flower, hands gripping the tongue petals reverently as he caressed the angry bone protrusions. They lapped at his little fingers, slathering them in a thick saliva as the tendrils forced his head into the gnashing tube of hungry teeth, 
leaking thick ropes of crimson down the ashen wood as little Thomas's skull was quickly crushed, beaming smile still plastered on his face as the flower began taking bites from him. Judith hyperventilated, curled into a fetal position while George wailed, holding his bloodied nose. The sounds of slurping and breaking bone gradually faded, the two remaining children sitting in silence for several long minutes even after the noises had stopped. It had been Judith who looked up first, streaks of tears running down her face, cheeks cherry red and her breathing little more than wheezing at this point. The flower was gone, as was the tree it had been attached to. Even the stains were gone. It had almost been as if it never happened. They had never run so fast in their lives. I used to work for a subway next to a liquor store along a fairly busy road. I hated the job, but I was only working there on Friday and Saturday evenings to make some extra money. The customers were friendly enough, referring to me as the blue-eyed girl, as we didn't have name tags. My co-workers were all right as well, being fun and interesting people, but my boss was a jerk. Luckily, I didn't have to see him often because he was only around during the mornings, Yet he'd always find a way to make my job more stressful. My boss would constantly say that our store was doing poorly in profits, and would make it so that only one person would be working for hours alone. I have no idea what he was talking about, because whenever I was working, I felt as though every resident in our city would make an appearance at some time during my shift. Luckily, I had a co-worker with me until about an hour before close, something I was truly grateful for. But that all changed after minimum wage went up. My boss figured he'd save the money he was losing by cutting hours even more. So instead of working with someone until 8.30 p.m. or 9 p.m., I would be alone from 6 p.m. until close, something that worried my mother and boyfriend. They didn't particularly like the thought of me being alone in the store for that long as I'm a girl. I didn't like the thought of it either, but what could I do? I dreaded the following weekend when the new schedule would be in effect. On Friday, my boyfriend agreed to stay with me until close, but on Saturday he couldn't, and so I begrudgingly made my way to work for 5 p.m. that day. I worked with someone else until 6 p.m., and then they left. I was now in the store alone. I was hoping it'd be dead in the store since a football game was on that night and This proved to be true. Not many people came in, so with the spare time, I started cleaning things early. So with the spare time, I started cleaning things early, as I knew it would take a lot longer to get everything done without anyone else helping me. And I'd bring many empty containers to the back room to wash them, returning to the front whenever I would hear the door alarm go off, signaling that a customer had just walked in. This went on for a couple of hours, and I hated every moment of it. I was in the back around 9 p.m., trying to finish washing some things when I heard the door alarm go off. We would be closed in just a half hour, so this was the point of my shift where I truly despised getting any customers. I finished rinsing the bowl I was washing and then reached for a paper towel, walking to the front to greet my unwanted customer. Much to my surprise, no one was there. I didn't see any cars out front, but I looked around the store briefly before returning to the back room. Whoever it was, they must have decided they didn't want anything. Not that I minded. A couple of minutes passed and then I heard the door alarm go off again. I briskly walked to the front, expecting a customer to be standing there looking at the menu, but when I got there, I did not see anyone standing there ready to order. Instead, I found a man sitting on the far end of the store at the back table. He appeared dirty, with scraggly hair and mud all over his pants. 
He tracked some in, I could see, and I wasn't too happy about it, knowing that I'd have to re-mop the floors. Despite my irritation, I greeted the man. Hello, sir. Are you waiting on someone or wanting a minute to look over the menu? He kept looking back and forth, from wall to wall, and occasionally out the window. He almost appeared disoriented, but would look at his phone every once in a while as though he were expecting a message from someone. He was fiddling with something in his pocket but wouldn't take it out. Most importantly, he didn't respond to my question, and I was getting pretty annoyed. Well, we'll be closing in 20 minutes, sir. Please keep that in mind. Again, he didn't respond. He just kept looking everywhere and anywhere but toward me. With an irritated sigh, I walked to the back room and began preparing the mop bucket, filling it with water and floor cleaner. This probably took about two minutes. Once it was ready, I wheeled it toward the front and quickly noticed that the man wasn't there anymore. He couldn't have left the store, however. I would have heard the door alarm go off if it had been opened. I grabbed my mop and looked toward the ground, but then I noticed the set of muddy footprints leading toward the bathroom door. Great. I'd have to mop the bathroom again, too. I began mopping the trail, leading toward the table where the man had sat, and all the way toward the bathroom door. As I finished cleaning the floor directly in front of the door, I heard the faint muffled cries of someone on the other side. I leaned in until my ear was almost against the door itself and listened silently. I could hear quiet sobs mixed with some words like, No, and I can't. What on earth was going on in there? I took a step back as quietly as I could and then was surprised by the sound of the door being unlocked. I immediately jumped away with mop in hand and was a good ten feet away when the door opened. The man emerged and stood there for a couple of moments when he saw me standing there. Then, for the first time, he looked me straight in the eye. This sent a chill down my spine. I held on to the mop nervously, almost defensively. His stare was blank and yet somehow sorrowful. He didn't say anything and quickly walked out the front entrance, setting off the door alarm. I turned and saw him make his way down the road, never looking back. I took a breath, loosening my grip on the mop and looked back toward the bathroom door. I reached for the handle and slowly opened the door, quickly peering around inside before actually entering. When I walked inside, I found a giant, muddy mess all over the floor, as though the man had been walking in circles in there. I sighed and quickly mopped up the filth, and turned to leave when I noticed the garbage can lid was on the ground beside it. I reached for it, bending over the can itself in order to retrieve it, when I happened to notice something shining inside. I could feel my face grow pale when I reached in and retrieved an open switchblade. The only other thing in the can was a crumpled piece of paper. I reached for it and slowly opened it. The words on it still haunt me to this day. 435 Wilson Road, Brunette, Blue Eyes, Saturday, 9 p.m., $1,200. I closed the store early that night. I didn't finish washing the dishes, and I didn't bother sweeping or mopping the back room. I just locked the door, put the food away, counted my drawer, and left. I quit the next day. I told my mom about what had happened, and she called the police. I gave them my description of the guy, as well as the knife and the note I had found. They thanked me for my information and told us that they'd do what they could to find the guy. My mom still freaks out about it and won't let me get another job. I don't go out as often, and I feel nervous every day. I always feel as though I'm being watched or hunted. I still wonder about that note sometimes, but in all honesty, I don't want to know. Whoever wrote it, whoever wanted to hurt me, I don't want to know. I may never know anyway, but one thing I do know is that I'll never work a closing shift again. You will never find me, so don't look, Lady B. Sure, I've heard your tales which are to instill fear in others. I find them laughable. 
Every town I roll in as a gypsy on the constant move, I will find some fast food burger joint and listen in anticipation as that maybe, just maybe, you found me out. After waiting for so long, I thought I'd out myself to you. No, it's not validation or even the exposed deeds which I've done that I seek I would rather cause you the fear, give you the nightmare that can keep you up at nights wondering if you might be next. You may have heard of certain chans which cannot be found on the regular net. There are some pretty sick fucks out there, but you shouldn't worry about them, as they are mere attention-seeking whores. They betray personal information and exchange nudes to exploit women to do unspeakable acts, or they threaten, and in many cases, ruin lives. All this is done as forms of entertainment for them. After my sister took her own life because of their relentless pursuit of her, I knew then the law could and would do nothing. I became the Chan Vigilante, or CV if you rather. My sister Marcia was not beautiful, rich, nor even a high risk taker. Her story is a simple one. In an act of good faith and love, she sent a series of self-nudes to her husband. Six months passed by and the marriage broke. This sick son of a bitch put them on something called pink meth, which is revenge porn. Hundreds of men took it upon themselves to exploit her and blackmail her. They kept demanding she pose more and more degrading images or they would expose her to us, her family, her church, and pastor, and even found ways to let her know where her friends and co-workers live. I was the only one she told and trusted. In a fit of hostile anger, I told her to refuse to send them anything more when they at last demanded she have a crush porn of a small kitten. They do all this in the name of their sick entertainment. After she refused, they did in fact send all of the image files not only to those mentioned, but to register sex offenders as well. Hate? No, I do not hate these men, as hateful people are careless. I am calculated and more creative than they. A true vigilante is no one you know of, heard of, or ever see headed your way. To the man who sent her image of her masturbating herself with a carrot, I arranged a date via Craigslist, which I said I wanted to pose for nudes and would do anything to get those photos taken as a surprise for my new boyfriend. Of course, it only took a few exchanges until he agreed to meet. I arranged for him to go to a coffee shop and look for a girl with the letter CV on her white knit hat. I laugh now as he must have been very eager. As soon as I walked in, he met me at the counter and even paid for my latte double whip. After a few moments, he talked me into going back to his place. I told him I'd follow in my car as I had some sexy outfits for the photos and they were in the trunk. It was the perfect place. The end of a road and the nearest house was at least two miles away. We shared a glass of wine and I slipped ground up devil's weed into his, which renders a person agreeable to anything. And I do mean anything. I told him to remove his clothes and he gladly could not resist, due to I am sure both the drug and an already willingness even before the herb. I took out my camera and took some rather harmful nudes. Although, to be honest, I did not find his body to be impressive at all. As the herb continued to weave through his disgusting system, I said, You know it would be sexy? If you took that curling iron of your wife's and stuck it deeply inside yourself. He did, of course, and as I plugged it in, I switched it on high. I left it on until I could smell the hairs of his anus burn and singe. All I could think was, Marcia, this is for you, and the sight of finding you laying there on your bathroom floor in a pool of blood and broken glass. I continued to snap photo after photo as the smoke rose. I knocked him over his head with a heavy candle base in his bathroom. I took his camera and put it on HD long play record. Beside the lens was a note which read, now, you must wonder when and to whom I plan to share your photos. Hugs and kisses, CV. 
That's my first victim, Midnight. And I have a list. There has been more. Care for me to send you the photos for your slideshows? I will once my mission, my vengeance, and my delightful end to misery is complete. Your fan, C.V. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and five-inch thick glass porthole-sized windows placed into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on but no bedding, running water and toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidences in their past, and the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were, and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other, and began alternately whispering to the microphones and one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think that they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it. Or rather, didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces, and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. Afterward, three more days passed. The researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure that they were working, since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming with five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm response. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. 
Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects' thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth, as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remained in place, the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the rib cage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food, it quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber, and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. When his heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word MORE over and over, weaker and weaker, until he fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility, the two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four-inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even through the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. 
Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed, he was unable to beg or object to surgery, and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, they try the surgery without anesthetic, and did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically impossible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well. Although they had to be injected with the paralytic for the duration of the operation, the surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced and they were placed back into the chamber awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project, considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point, all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might. First left, then right then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering from brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of a deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flatlines as one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point-blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things, not with you! He screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? He demanded. I must know! 
The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So nearly free. This story was sent to me as a true story through my submissions website at 707spookyboo22.com. While growing up, I had the same doll every other girl had. It was one of those baby dolls in the pink baby jammies with white polka dots that would cry or whine, saying, I want another drink of water. I would pull her string all of the time, and she would come up with whatever recording they put inside of her. I was so happy when my mom and dad gave her to me. She was my favorite and was always by my side no matter where I went. She kept me company at night when it was dark and made me feel better when the strange scratching noises happened in my closet. The scratching noises had been going on for months. When I asked my mom about the scratching noises, she said it was probably just mice and they would take care of it. She had some man come out and take a look all around the closet and outside but he didn't find anything. He even put out a few traps, but nothing was ever caught. We lived out in the country, and field mice would always try to get into the house if the cat didn't catch them first, so maybe they just stayed around during the day was what they thought. I knew it didn't sound like mice, and sometimes it sounded as if they were voices whispering. But late at night, I would pull that string on my doll over and over again while making her cry, whine, and tell me cute little phrases to cover the noises until I fell asleep. Then one night when the scratching noises were really loud, the string broke. Right as she finished saying, close your eyes, mommy, the end of the sentence dropped off into a deep voice as if the recording died and the white pull string popped off into my hand. I tried pulling the string over and over again, but the sound just wouldn't come out. I knew if I called for my mom that she wouldn't be proud of me sleeping alone in the dark. So I laid there, wide-eyed and searching for any sign of movement. Then I heard them, the scratches. They were no longer in my closet, but closer to my bed. I swear I felt something move over the blanket and then something warm hold my hand. I was in tears, but I didn't dare scream. I wasn't afraid of waking my mom up now. I was afraid of whatever this thing was, knowing I was awake. Just then my doll string pulled and she giggled. I was shaking and sweating. The string pulled again. This time she did the usual cry. I suddenly sat up and threw her across the room. That wasn't very nice, she cried out. I ran from the room screaming for my mom. Down the hall I screamed and then jumped into my parents' bed, crying my eyes out. I wouldn't tell them what was wrong, so my dad went into the room to check. He said everything looked fine, and through my tears my mom rocked me back to sleep in their room. The next day they told me it was probably just a nightmare. That day they had an exterminator out who didn't find any mouse droppings or anything else in the closet. There were no holes or nests in the walls. My mom slept in my room that night and nothing happened. I didn't even touch my doll. 
She still sat in the corner with her head all twisted and her arms and legs in an impossible position. I looked at her once and then turned away. Everything was quiet. The next night I braved by myself. I fell asleep figuring that maybe throwing the doll against the wall had scared away whatever was in my room. Then, some time in the middle of the night, I felt a tug next to my arm. It was a string pulling on my doll. Somehow she had made it back into my arms. Why did you hurt me? She said in the awful, whiny voice. I screamed and screamed until my mom came running into the room. When I told her about the doll, she brought me into the living room and we burned it in our huge fireplace. For a moment, as the flames engulfed the face and the rubber melted, I swear it screamed. I knew by the look on my mom's face that she had heard it as well. She said it was probably just air escaping out of the doll. After the doll was destroyed and carried out with the rest of the garbage, I never heard another scratch in my room again. This is Spooky Boo. If you enjoyed the story, please give it a thumbs up. Also, if you've had a similar experience with a creepy doll, I'd love to hear about it. Go ahead and leave it in the comments, or if you'd like me to read it on the channel, visit my submission guidelines at www.707spookyboo22.com and click on the submissions tab. I'd love to hear your story. Aw, oh, come on girl, smile, he says as I pass. Hey, now smile! This time rolling along behind me, just a yard or so away. Why not give us a little smile? You know, you would look so much prettier if you just smile. He calls out louder. I stop walking. This is not a new situation to me, and millions of women throughout the world. The act of something seemingly so simple as being compelled to smile by others mostly men, and living with its various consequences. It is an everyday occurrence with varying intentions that are left up to our instincts to interpret properly. In other words, it's a real pain in the butt. It can also be a grim matter of survival. Intent can, of course, range from the casual and usually innocent, aw, it can't be that bad, smile, to the aggressive and obviously offensive. What, you too good to smile at me? Up yours, witch. <laughs> See what I mean? Personally, I try to take care when reacting to the calls and remarks from those men along my path. They always range from my sweet and truly kind bus driver, or the postman just passing along the sidewalk, to the big difference of someone following me as I make my way to work. At this moment, the latter seems bound and determined to get my attention. Smile for me, little mama. He snarls again. When that fails to get his desired response from me, he resorts to the usual snarl of, Darn girl, wouldn't hurt you to smile. You ain't all that. Slowly, I turn around, and I give him exactly what he's been asking of me this whole time. All three blocks worth, to be exact. So, now he's just a few feet from me, and I close the gap between us quicker than he could blink. Suddenly, sitting before me is a grown man straddling a rusty BMX and sucking on the bent straw of a quick stop cup. His eyes squint when he sees me there, and I see he's also a bit surprised at how easily the distance between us closed. Yet the smirk still remains on his lips, 
as he cast a long look from my toes all the way up to what is now my full, bright smile. Except, he is not smiling back. Now, I wonder why. Well, I'll just smile bigger, so he can see all my teeth. Yes, that will do the trick. There, now he can see every single one of them, in all their beauty, gleaming rows of sharp silver peaks. Still no smile back? Hmm, don't you think that's rude? Okay, I'll just open wider and give him the biggest smile that he's ever seen. His mouth is just gaping and starting to tremble a little though, but his eyes are stuck wide open. Aw, come on, give us a scream. I say in my sweetest voice, you'll look so much prettier when you scream. <laughs> Eve was deep inside an empty cave when she found the pocket watch. She almost stepped on it, but jerked her foot back as she saw a glimmer of gold on the rocky surface. Excited because she had never found anything valuable during her spelunking excursions, she snatched up the watch. When her helmet light illuminated it, she could see it was ancient. To her surprise, she also saw that it was ticking. That evening, Eve sat in her apartment, examining the pocket watch and trying to figure out how to set it to the correct time. There was a little button at the top, and when she pressed it, the hands came to a halt. That's when she noticed that everything had gone quiet. The TV in the other room was no longer blaring, and she didn't hear the usual sounds of honking and kids playing outside. Strange, Eve muttered, walking to the window. She peered outside and saw a very strange sight indeed. Every person, animal and car, seemed to have stopped dead in their tracks. Her heart pounded as her brain tried to comprehend what she was seeing. Suddenly, Eve remembered that old Twilight Zone episode and grabbed the watch. She pressed the button again and everything sprang back to life. Eve grew very fond of that pocket watch. She never particularly liked people and now she could shut them up entirely for however long she wanted. She used the watch to stop time for days, weeks, and finally months at a time, enjoying the peacefulness and freedom. One day she pressed the button and left time paused for nearly 20 years. She relished the solitude during those two decades. She took whatever she desired. She went to public spots that were always too crowded to enjoy before. She felt so lucky that she could cheat time but finally, the day came when Eve missed people. She figured she'd unfreeze everything for a year and then go back to living in isolation. She sat in her apartment looking out the window as she pressed the button on the pocket watch. The world that had been frozen for 20 years jolted to life. Eve realized she suddenly felt different her joints were aching, and she was hunching over. She turned towards the nearest mirror and screamed at what she saw. Instead of her 40-year-old face, a frail old woman looked back. Time had caught up with her. She dove for the watch and immediately pressed the button again. She didn't want to age another second. Eve took a hot shower that night, cringing at her wrinkled, aching body. She started to step out of the shower when she slipped and fell, slamming her head against the side of the bathtub with a loud crack. She lay there, 
feeling a warm puddle of blood ooze around her. As the world started to slip away, she had one thought. Who's going to start the watch up again? My dog Nash barks in the kitchen. Ever since we got him last summer, he randomly stands in front of a cupboard underneath the sink and growls. For hours. Until I have to pull him away by the collar. It's annoying, to be honest. He is rather large and his barks are loud enough that they drown out the television completely. I've yelled at him and threatened him with my shoes, but he never shuts his mouth. He just paws at the cupboard door. I'd be lying if I said that I hadn't thought about getting rid of him. Too risky to keep him around. I wouldn't, really, though. The kids have gotten too attached to him in such a short amount of time. All four of them. Funny thing is, I can understand why he's concerned with that cupboard. The cupboard smells really bad, and I can't even begin to describe it. It is metallic and rotten. I can't get too close to it without vomiting. I need to clean it out, but my hands won't stop trembling from horror. The horror born from what I saw three months ago, when I finally had enough and opened the cupboard. Red. Just red. Sticky, bubbling red that had veins and meat and organs and bone pieces embedded into it. Glass eyes that stared at me, bristles of black fur that blew in cold air. A long snout and nose and a tail and paws that I recognized instantly. The remains of our last dog. The one that went missing a month before we bought Nash. I keep on locking up the cupboard, but it always keeps opening again. There is a house in an urban community. In this house lives a dog, a man, and a woman. The man and woman have been happily married for decades now. They are old and have hair that has been bleached over time. They have mouths that lack teeth and faces riddled with wrinkles, formed after constant smiling. These are happy people. A smile always chinks their eyes and scrunches their faces whenever they speak to each other. Their house is riddled with crosses and pictures of their lord. The weather couple is devoted to Christianity. They pray nightly, say grace, and wear rosaries. They all do all these things to get in touch with him. That's how they explain it. The man and wife never skip Sunday Mass. They devote an hour to their saviour every weekend. They want to get into the paradise. They do everything they can to assure themselves a spot in heaven. The dog is a recent addition to the family and has been with the man and woman for three years. He takes turns rotating on whose staff he sits on whenever the man and woman watch television. This is how most of their days are spent, watching television. They watch religious programs, which are 30 minute shows of a preacher expressing how God is great and Satan is bad. These rants are played over a still image of a crucifix with Jesus on it. They watch these all day for 12 hours straight. They wake up, let the dog out and turn on their dated television box to watch these motivating bits of entertainment. These programs last from 8 in the morning to 8 at night. The man and the woman watch all of them, one program after the next, every day. It's like they were hypnotised. Their dog spends hours outside, as he is often forgot about, sometimes even the whole day. Dog wastes time chasing bugs or eating the dry kibble lying around. The dog is messy when he eats, typically knocking the food out of the bowl. Even though he gets left outside and forgot about most days, he still loves his owners. Regardless of when the dog is led inside, he always smothers them with love, licking toes and legs and faces. After watching their programs, the woman prepares meat for dinner. It is the same meat every day. She makes enough to feed herself, her husband and the dog. This breaks off the monotony of the dog eating kibble every day. After dinner, the dog is put into the laundry room, 
which acts as his makeshift bedroom. The laundry room is right next to the another door. This one leads to the basement. This door is always kept closed when the man and woman aren't going through it. The dog tried following the man in one time, but was blocked from entering. The man always plays music when he and woman descend into the basement, and this tune is what puts the dog to sleep. The dog always hears thrax and the sounds of dragging, but he never wakes up. The only thing that wakes him up is the petting he receives in the morning by the woman. He then gets taken outside and the previous day repeats. One day, the dog received no petting. He woke up on his own. The basement door was closed. The house was silent. The dog walked into an empty family room with a dead television. The man and woman should have been right there, watching their programs. There was a knocking noise that caught the dog's attention. It led it back to the laundry room, where the dog sniffed and searched for the source. The basement door slammed open, causing the dog to bend its head backwards towards the door curiously. Nobody came out, yet the door remained open. The dog walked towards the door and sniffed inside. The dog could smell the woman. There was nothing to be seen beyond a few steps, leading down to the basement. The dog was drawn to the scent, so he took a couple of steps down the stairs, and the door behind him slammed shut. The dog froze and was surrounded by darkness. He continued down the stairs. The blinding lights flashed on. The scent of the woman vanished. So the dog continued forward and searched for that comforting scent. The room was filled with tools, tables littered with tools. There were hatches, meat hooks, drills, saws and crowbars. All of them clean. The entire room was clean. There was also a door that was cracked open. It had a crucifix and the word paradise attached to it. The door the dog originally entered through had disappeared, leaving this as the only option. All the dog wanted was to find his owners. The dog used his nose to push the door open and advanced through. This room was worse than the previous. The dog's paws were instantly painted with blood. On the walls hung children. There were dozens of them, all around the room. They were all shackled and hung by the wrists. Their heads were drooped forward and their eyes were open. They were forced open. They had no eyelids, only torn skin that resembled ripped tissue paper. The bodies of these children were mangled and naked. One kid was severed into two. His entrails were still connected to his lower half, which led limp on the floor. There were organs strewn all around the mess. Some were missing eyes arms and legs. Some had no skin, leaving muscle exposed. Other children were cleansed of their muscle, leaving a corpse that contrasted with skin and fatty tissues on one part of the body, while another was partly bone. The missing arms and legs were found on tables, mutilated. Skin and meat was spread amongst these tables. Some of the meat was stored in Tupperware containers. The sight didn't bother the dog. Finding his owners was his only concern. He scanned the room, seeing a bloody sink, a gramophone, and a large black zip-up bag that had something inside of it. The dog saw no exits, like in the previous room. The door he came from disappeared. The dog was stuck in this doorless room. The scent of the woman reappeared, and it led the dog to the gramophone. A tune started to play, the same one the dog heard every night. The dog recognised this familiar tune and fell asleep. The dog woke up, but he saw through the eyes of the woman. He couldn't control her movements. The dog was being shown something. He saw a typical death through her eyes. She was watching the religious programme with her husband. Her eyes were stuck to the screen, but she didn't hear the television. She heard her god. He told her that he was proud of her and her husband for the sacrifices of many children. He was ready to guarantee them and place them to heaven, but he asked for one more sacrifice. He needed them to take the life of someone they loved. He demanded that they sacrifice their dog. The devoted followers obeyed, and through the eyes of the woman, the dog saw her walk towards the backyard door to let him in. The man went to the basement. The woman smiled at the dog and picked him up. She followed the man into the basement. 
The dog saw himself through the woman's eyes and looked at the familiar, clean, basement room he was just in. The woman continued walking to the second room. She walked by the man. He was preoccupied. He was washing something in the sink. The woman placed the dog on one of the tables covered with limbs and human tissue. The dog's paws squished from the cold dead flesh and muscle. The dog sniffed the table as the woman left to the other room. Music started playing. That same familiar song the dog was used to. The woman returned with a smile and a cleaver. She approached the dog. He sniffed at the object in her hand curiously as his tail wagged eagerly. The dog's eyes were glued to the cleaver in the woman's right hand. The dog jumped as the woman patted him with her left hand to act as brief comfort. The dog's perspective changed back to his own. He stared at the grin she had on her face and continued staring until the cleaver was brought down upon his face. Everything went black. The dog woke up in the laundry room. He didn't wake up to petting like he used to. The basement door was closed. The house was silent. The dog walked into an empty family room with a dead television. I'd see him from the corner of my eye. He would just be leaning against the wall, almost out of sight, just smiling at me with those wild, deep green eyes. That is my first memory of him, just standing there, smiling and a second later, he was gone. It was ages before I saw him again, but I felt him all the time. One night, I awoke to a gentle, sensual caress of his hand on my cheek. His brilliant green eyes only inches from my face. I felt a cold breeze blow softly across my naked back. I shivered and closed my eyes against the chill. When I opened them again, he had gone without a trace. The next time he came was a horrible night. It was a night when my then boyfriend had decided, in a drunken rage, that I was cheating on him and had proceeded to do his best to kill me. Somehow I had gotten away and managed to make it back home, broken, bloody, and scared. I locked every door and curled up in bed, covers wrapped around me so tightly that I could barely move. Suddenly, I felt an intense wave of calm wash over me. I opened my eyes, and there he was, leaning on my closet door. That same bright smile playing on his lips. His handsome face strained with worry. Without a word, he lays down next to me and wraps himself around me protectively. I felt safe, but the coolness of his touch made me shiver. 
I woke the next morning and was amazed that I felt no effect from the nightmarish beating I had taken the night before. Later that day, my phone started blowing up with text messages telling me that my then boyfriend had been found dead in his apartment after not showing up for work that day. Suspected overdose. The crazy thing about it is he drank, but he never did any kind of drugs. That night, I felt so conflicted happy to be safe but I had truly loved him most of my adult life I was completely heartbroken my tears refused to stop coming I cried myself to sleep A now familiar chill came over my body. He's here, my mind whispered with excitement. I heard his deep, soft voice breathing in my ear, telling me that no one would ever hurt me again. His hands explored my body. His touch was so cold, like he had just walked in from a snowstorm, even though it was the dead of summer. His touch made me tingle all over, like no man's touch had ever done before. The next morning, I woke to him gone again. I was sad. Why did he not stay with me and let me wake to that amazing smile? Things went on like this for a while. One night, he turned my face to his and kissed me deeply, biting my lip. His hand ventured from my face to my breast and my breath caught on my chest. It was then that I realized I was cold, not from the outside, but from the inside. I pulled away, and as my breath finally escaped my lips, it came out in a vaporous cloud, like the first breath in a frigid winter morning. He put a finger against my lips, exploring and tantalizing my senses. My body tingled from the chill of his touch. I could not stop. I wanted this so badly. More of his touch, more of him. But he stopped and wrapped my blanket tightly around me and held it in place as he lay atop it. For two or three weeks, I would only see him at a distance. And when I rushed to where he had been, he would be gone. I was so sad feeling I had lost him. I cried and begged to whatever higher power there was to bring him back to me. The next week when I had given up on ever seeing him again, there he was, my body tense with anticipation. He lay on the bed behind me, 
in the spoon position and softly spoke in my ear. I have to go, my darling. This will be our last night together, but believe me when I tell you, I will always be here. He says this as he places his hand over my heart. I felt the sting of his touch on my chest. He rolls me over and kisses my neck. My body begs for more. Our bodies intertwined. I knew in my soul that this was it, the end of us, but somehow I was only thankful for the experience. The night will last a lifetime. I fell asleep shivering in his arms. The combination of exhaustion and his frigid touch. A month later, I received an email from an unknown address and opened it to a death notice dated 12-15-2004. About a young man who had lost his life in a tragic accident after he had witnessed his classmate murdered by her boyfriend in a fit of jealousy. I scrolled to the bottom of the article with tears in my eyes for the precious young soul lost in such a tragic way. At the bottom of the page was a photo of a handsome young man with dark hair and the most piercing green eyes. My breath caught. It was him. But this was almost 12 years ago. 12 years ago, the first time I saw him. I also got some news today, and by some miracle, I am pregnant. My late boyfriend's parents are thrilled that there will be a piece of their son left in this world. I just don't have the heart to tell them that even now I can feel the icy cold growing inside of me every day. This event took place during October of 2015. I was with my journalism group for a Halloween video project. We decided to take ourselves to the most haunted places in our area and film some stuff. You know, trying to be the local ghost hunters of our town to entertain fellow classmates. Anyway, the locations we went to were the haunted forest where people go to commit suicide, the building called Hell House where Satanists go to perform rituals, Crybaby Bridge, where they say a woman killed her baby. And finally, Hook's Tomb, where you perform a number of things on a certain tombstone and you smell roses. The group was small, about five people in total, so we only took one vehicle. Our first stop was at the Suicide Forest. It was about seven o'clock at night and the atmosphere alone was enough to freak us out. But even though we were scared, we made our way in by climbing the chain link fence. The forest was cut off by the public and has been for years. 
On the fence was a sign that read, Someone out there loves you. Suicide is not the answer. And it had the suicide hotline underneath it. We got about half a mile into the woods before we stopped and started to film. I was the spokesperson for this location, so I had to do all the talking while in this area. The camera was set up and I stood in front of it. I had this uneasy feeling that someone was watching us record for our video. Even though I had this feeling, I didn't tell anybody and signaled Katie to press the record button. This is Suicide Forest, located in the farthest part of Arrow Lake. Back in 1987, over 20 people entered this forest and ended their lives together. Their bodies were located so deep in the woods that it took days until a group of teenagers found them hanging from the trees. It is said that this forest is now haunted by the souls that died there. The atmosphere alone can send chills down a person's spine. Our next location is to... I stopped talking when I heard rustling in the bushes behind me. I knew it was no one from our group because they were all behind the camera. They stared in horror behind me and Katie picked up the camera after screaming run. I didn't question it. I took off as fast as I could towards the exit. We got to the fence and quickly climbed it. I jumped off the top of the fence and rolled across the gravel, jumping back up to my feet. I didn't bother to look back and see if anything was chasing us. At this point, I didn't care. I just wanted to get out of there. I climbed into the vehicle and called for the others to get in quickly so we could get the hell out of there. As we sped off in a panic, I looked back towards the lot our car had been in. In the lot, I saw a red truck in the far corner, hidden by the darkness. I spoke up quietly to inform the others. Guys, there was a red truck in the parking lot. Do you think whoever was in that truck was messing with us? What kind of person would be willing to walk into the woods just to mess with some kids, Sam? Shannon asked from the driver's seat. Oh, I don't know. A security guard trying to scare us away? The others agreed with me and we decided to keep going and finish our video. We made it to Hell House and Crybaby Bridge without something going wrong. We took pictures in the locations and caught some orbs. At Crybaby Bridge, we put baby powder on the hood of our vehicle, shut the car off, and in unison said, We have your baby. What was supposed to happen was for baby footprints to appear in the powder. A baby was supposed to cry, which was really just the mountain lions that live near the bridge. And our car was supposed to not start and the doors locked so we couldn't get back inside. Instead, we caught the mountain lion cries and the car wouldn't start. There were no footprints and the doors never locked. Anyway, when we got to the last location, Katie stood in front of the mausoleum and I pressed play. This tomb has a legend behind it. Tonight, we will be demonstrating what to do in order to smell the sweet scent of roses. Just don't jump up and down on the tomb. You can ask Sam's dad what happens if you do. Katie said with a smirk thrown my way. We demonstrated what to do, and the legend was true. A sweet scent of roses filled the air, which caused us to freak out and burst into a fit of happiness. As we made our way back to the car, there was a note taped to the windshield. I'm coming for you soon. As the note was getting passed around for everyone to read, I saw the red truck slowly drive past the cemetery. The driver was unrecognizable, half covered by the darkness. We quickly got in the car and sped off the opposite direction. Later that night, we were talking in the group chat made for the video and decided to pull the video from ever being seen. On occasion, the red truck would be seen by someone within the group. I tried catching his license plate, but the car was bare. No plates whatsoever. It got to the point where we had to tell the police. The man seemed to disappear after a few weeks of stalking. It's been about two years, but I still fear for our safety. I carry a knife with me everywhere I go, just in case. So here's the story that happened to me during my freshman year of high school. I'd gotten a part in a play as a police officer, and because my drama club needed to rehearse, we used the auditorium during the nighttime. Me and a classmate of mine grabbed a quick bite to eat. We weren't due on stage yet for the dress rehearsal, and walked back to the school in the rain. My classmate needed to grab something from her locker, which was on the third floor. We were in the middle of a conversation, laughing as we talked about classes, school life, etc., and we ascended the stairs. I noticed a janitor eyeing us earlier, and I heard him call the maintenance elevator. 
I didn't pay much attention. I should have. Once we got to our locker, we heard the clacking of a broomstick against the floor as it came toward us. We screamed and hauled ass back down to the auditorium and got ready to get on stage. Sometimes, I think that maybe he thought we were up to no good. Although, I'm sure he would have seen the rehearsal going on earlier. Maybe he had sinister intentions. We'll never know. Josh and I were seniors in high school who wanted to become math majors. He was more into solving difficult puzzles and I was more into making the solutions more faster and clean. Nonetheless, we were both teenage boys who enjoyed messing around with one another. On his birthday, his sister gave him a 10x10x10 10 by 10 by 10 Rubik's Cube. His parents gave him a car, an old Mustang his father just finished tuning up a week prior. I gave him a book about the history of math. Throughout the next couple of weeks, I noticed him changing. He started to talk less and less. He started to grow more thin and more tired. At lunch, his hands would just fidget on the lunch table. He spent most of his days either at home or at the library. After a three month absent from school, it was announced that he had an eating disorder and starved himself to death. We had an assembly firm in the gym. When it was his sister's turn to speak, she started out by saying nice things about him before breaking down and blurring about him that it was her fault that he was dead. He never had an eating disorder. He spent all his time trying to solve that Rubik's Cube she had gave him for his birthday. That is when I remembered this one time he had went to the washroom and left this Rubik's Cube on his desk. I thought it would be funny if I rearranged the stickers on it. I've been selling ground meat and sausage made from people I've killed to the hipster restaurants in the city. You know the type. Ones with terms like locally sourced ingredients emblazoned on every surface. Like it somehow makes their food taste good. Not that what I'm selling them tastes bad, mind you. They love it. Everyone does. They think they're getting some of the heritage breed pork from those woolly mongolitsa pigs I've got in the yard. Well, they're not. Those little guys aren't for sale. The restaurants are buying and serving human remains. Let me guess. I'm a monster. Uh, another madman killing innocent people, right? Another psychopath? Well, no. Maybe. Probably not. Here's the thing. It's not that I don't like people. I know everyone has hopes and dreams and blah blah blah. I had hopes and dreams too. I had a butcher shop and loyal customers for 40 years. Then all the kids started moving in. White kids just out of college. Kids with jobs in technology or some other abstract shit that pays an ungodly amount of money. Five times what everyone else in our neighborhoods were making. Kids without a care in the world for generations of culture they were trampling on. Rent went up fast. Our neighborhoods changed fast. Family businesses that had been operating for years couldn't afford to stay there anymore and were forced to shut down. After just 10 years, the city was nothing like it had been. Gentrification was the word that kept getting thrown around. People talked about it like it was a good thing. I was lucky. I had a nest egg saved up and didn't even try to keep paying the rent as it skyrocketed. I saw where it was all going. I closed the shutters on the shop bought some land upstate, had the foresight to acquire some mongolitsas before they became popular and expensive, and started my little company. Once a month, I'd drive my van around the old neighborhoods on late Friday and Saturday nights. I'd invite the stumbling, drunken kids to get in for a ride, hit them over the head, 
and head on back to the farm. Easy peasy mongolitsy. Anyway, the great thing about these hipster joints is the owners will cut whatever corners they can if it means they can get an edge on a new hot product. What does that mean for me? Well, they drive up early Monday morning, buy the meat from me without any USDA stamp, and head on back to the city with a week's worth of meat. That leaves me with cash in hand and great dirt on the restaurant owners if they ever learn my little secret. According to one of my buyers, a guy whose claim to fame was when he beat Bobby Flay on TV, the next big thing will be meat from suckling pigs, baby piglets who've only consumed milk from their mothers. I glanced at his wife, who he'd brought to show her a real farm, and to see how the other half lives. She nodded absently while cradling a tiny newborn to her chest, her own little suckling animal. The guy went on and on about the quality of unweaned milk-fed product. He went through the recipes he planned out. They sounded pretty great, to be honest. Lots of fresh fennel. I pictured the people bound and gagged in their pens in my basement, three men and nine women. Basic arithmetic and logistics made me close my eyes for a moment as I thought about how I'd fill the order. The guy talked as I worked out the numbers. I'll be happy to pay you in advance for not only the product, but for exclusivity. We strolled around the pig pens as his wife worried aloud about whether the baby could get sick from the smell. Eleven months, I announced. The guy smiled. Apparently, he expected a year or more. I shook his weak, uncalloused hand, nodded at his politely smiling wife, and patted the infant on its little pink head. They drove off in the Volvo, leaving me with a big bag of cash. Once they were long gone, I headed down to the basement. I thought about the orders I had to fill over the next few months, then slit the throats of the two smaller men and hung them up to drain. I shifted the rest of them around in their pens until I had the grouping I wanted. As I was heading back upstairs, I turned around and called out to the remaining man who was sitting in the corner of the pen housing him and his four companions. Better start fucking, buddy. Your children are my future. I often like to view creepy things on the internet. I don't totally know why. I've just always been intrigued by things that are just... off. Any media is fine to take in the content. Stories, movies, videos, audio clips, video games, whatever. I just want to be unnerved. I work through a shift so my sleep schedule is all messed up. I sleep during the day and work at night. I get two days off a week, so... And always in a row. I could use this time to have some semblance of a normal life. But... I remember and I have to readjust my sleep schedule once work starts again. So, I just stay up all night and sleep during the day. So, browsing the internet on one of those days off, I came to a thread which had a bunch of links on it. Each comment was just a link. Some of them led to websites about unexplained mysteries. Some were streams of horror movies, and others were of accounts of paranormal events which were supposedly true. Then, I saw one that was none of the above. I don't remember what the link was. It was just random letters and numbers. It was nonsense. I clicked on it and it took me to a single page with a single picture and nothing to click on. It auto full screen and refresh at random intervals anywhere between roughly 2 and 10 seconds. There was text on the top of the picture which read X A N L O U W A L colon X T O 
DLE backslash question mark X. Creepy. I like this site already. The picture showed a painting on the wall of a nondescript forest scene. There was a small TV screen centered at the bottom of the picture. An old CRT. On top of the TV was an older looking analog clock with a wood frame and fancy hands. The site continued to refresh, but the picture never changed. Out of sheer curiosity, I didn't leave the page. I kept the tab open and checked back every minute or two. Still no change. After about 10 minutes, I got tired of missing the refreshes. Maybe it was changing drastically, but only once every minute or something. And I was completely missing it. So, I closed all other tabs to make sure I wouldn't be tempted to leave. I was staring at the picture for what seemed to be an hour. I checked my phone. It had been 26 minutes. I guess time goes slowly when you're just staring at a still image online. I can't say what it was or when it was, but at some point I noticed that it wasn't just a still image. Well, it was, but the image was changing. The clock. When I first pulled up the page, read something close to 4.15. Now it was showing 4.56. The clock had been changing the entire time. I watched it for a full minute. And somewhere among the refreshes, I saw the minute hand change to 57. The time on the clock didn't reflect the real time. Still, though, this was dedication. Someone had to take a picture once per minute for an hour, or at least 45 minutes, and then have it change every minute. I kept watching it until it showed 5 o'clock. I expected it to shift back to 4 o'clock. But it just went on to 501. That's even more impressive. Maybe it went for a full 12 hours. Someone needs a job. Anyway, now I was hooked. I had to see if it had the full range of times. Now that I knew I didn't have to intently stare at the picture anymore, I was able to shift my focus to the text. It definitely seemed strange. I realized quickly that it was a code of sorts. And it said, XIIXIX. -I, -I, I thought about it for a while, but then realized the colon in the phrase. XIIX -I colon XIX. 1219. I guess I had to wait till 1219 to see what was going to happen. What was so worth all this work? The next few hours were boring. I checked it every so often and see no change. Once I thought I saw something in the painting, but I'm pretty sure that was just my imagination. And my mind wanted to see something. I set all my clocks in my house to the time on this site, so I know where it was even when I wasn't at the computer. 12 o'clock came, and I was glued to my computer. No getting up. No other tabs. I was just staring intently, watching the hands on the clock refresh, minute after minute. 12.18, refresh, refresh, refresh. I was certain 
that this minute had actually taken four or five minutes to transpire. Finally, 1219. Nothing. No change in the image. No change to the sight. That was disappointing. I figured I'd at least get a message on the site, or a different picture or something. Maybe that was the prank. Nothing. The guy who made this would lure people in, give them a simple puzzle to solve, just to pique their intrigue, and then disappoint them greatly. Bravo, I thought to myself. Or brava, I quickly corrected. I left the website and went back to my day. I couldn't get the sight out of my head, though not even an hour after I left, I had convinced myself that I should go back to the site. Control plus shift plus T. After all, there are two 1219s in a day, aren't there? The clock now said 12.48. I looked over at the clock on my desk, and it also said 12.48. The creator must have kept us synced up with their local time or something. I had a nearly 12 hour wait ahead of me now. I could have stayed up all night. Night for me. Day for most normal people. I didn't want to drive myself crazy, so I went to sleep. I didn't sleep well or for very long, but then again, I rarely do. I checked the clock on the desk, which was still set to the website time, and it said 8.52, only a little over three hours of a wait from here. I checked the site, and still no change in the image. I did things around the house and online to kill the next few hours. As soon as the clock was near 12 o'clock though, I was once again seated firmly in front of my computer screen. The next 18 minutes were agonizing. The last minute was even worse. The hands of the clock once again struck 1219. And once again, nothing happened. I was distraught. I had invested a lot of time into this. The minute wasn't over though. So I continued to watch. I then heard a click. Quiet but still audible. After that, I noticed that the page wasn't constantly refreshing anymore. The screen on the TV began to brighten. Finally, what I had waited for was happening. As the screen on the TV brightened, I began to be able to make out an image. It was small, because the TV screen on my monitor was only about two inches wide, but I could still clearly see that they were showing woods. Maybe it was the forest in the picture. The camera was bobbing up and down as grass and leaves passed by. It must have been someone filming themselves walking. The camera was kept pointed at the ground for the first minute or so, but then slowly started to point more horizontally. I could see that they were coming up on a yard. Some houses flashed quickly on the edges of the screen. There was some talking in another language. I couldn't say what the language was and then clicks and clunks like they were dealing with equipment. The camera made larger movements than before. I realized as the sound went away and the image stabilized dramatically that they had been setting it up on a tripod. Once they got set up, I heard a little more talking. The camera made one final turn. During the turn, I could see it was set up just along the woods. The camera finally stopped shaking, and there was a house center within the frame. As small as it was, I could tell it was my house. I jumped up from my desk chair, but kept my eyes fixed on the screen. The men abandoned their camera and walked up to the house, walked up to my house. They stood at the door for what was probably 20 seconds, that seemed like 5 minutes. I didn't know what to do, I didn't know if there was anything to do.
They knocked on the door. I heard it faintly through my speakers. Lil wasn't at the door. Not hearing it within my house calmed me down enough to check the door. Nobody was there. Nobody was in the yard. I couldn't make anything out past a couple hundred feet. It was dark out, and the moon wasn't very bright. I closed and locked the door, and ran back up to the computer. The screen was still displaying these two men standing at the door. They knocked again, but this time harder. I watched as the door opened. A man answered it. I couldn't make him out. I was half expecting it to be me. I was relieved, though, to see that it wasn't. I had brown hair, and the man on the screen had red hair. One of the men gestured something to him, and the red-haired man began to close the door. At this point, the other man shoves the door open again, pulls a gun from his belt, and shoots the man in the head. I felt my face go pale and my jaw fall open. My vision started to go black, but I forced myself to keep my composure. The two men ran from the door and towards the camera. In a small TV screen on my monitor, and in the blur of motion, I could see that both men were smiling widely. They grabbed the camera, not bothering to take it off the tripod, and ran into the woods again. The camera swiveled on the tripod and showed one of the men's faces, but quite blurrily. He looked at the camera, reached over toward it with his other hand and the screen on the TV went black. The page refreshed again, but only once. And the clock still read, 12.19. I exited out of my browser, and even shut down my computer. I ran to the door one last time to see if I could see anything. Once again, there was nobody there. To this day, I have no clue what actually took place. I haven't had the nerve to revisit that website or ask anybody what happened to the people who lived here before I did. And I'm not sure I ever will. My mum may have almost been Bundy's last victim. My mum has told me this story for years and I always thought it was cool and so creepy. This happened two days before Ted Bundy was finally caught. For background on Ted Bundy, if you need it, he was a serial killer who brutally murdered many, many female victims. Always young and pretty, which is exactly what my mother was. Just under two months before this story takes place, he went into a college dorm at Florida State University and murdered two girls in there. Then he went to a nearby house and brutally beat up and injured three more, all in the span of about 15 minutes. At the time of this story, that was the most recent of his known murders, but it was later found he actually killed a poor little 12-year-old girl between being caught and the college girl's murder. He was handsome and young and his M.O. was to be very friendly and charming and his clean-cut appearance made women trust him. Now, to my, well, my mum's story, my mother and father had moved to Tallahassee two months prior and we were living in a so-so area of apartment complexes. My dad was in school at FSU and had a Monday science lab that would let out at unpredictable times, dependent entirely on how long that day's experiment lasted. My mum had not yet found a job and was pretty bored most of the day. She'd go walk to campus on Mondays to try and meet my dad and the timing happened to be right. But this particular day, this lab had let out before she got there and she didn't see him. So she walked back to their apartment. As she was walking, she turned the corner onto the street where the apartments were, on the other side of the road. Just as she did this, a guy in an orange Volkswagen Beetle, a pretty rare car, at least the colour, was coming down the street towards her. And leaned over and waved at her in a really friendly, excited manner. My mother was rather confused. She and my dad didn't really know anyone down there, but she gave us more wave back. They had met another young couple a week before and for a second she thought it might be the husband but then thought it would be weird for him to wave so excitedly at someone he knew only a little bit. 
she suddenly felt really uncomfortable about it and wanted to check to see if he was still around without really obviously turning and looking. She realised if she crossed the street toward her apartment, she could get a good look at to her right more naturally. As she did so, she saw the car had stopped just across the intersection she had turned the corner around initially. She could see by the lights that the guy was sitting with his foot on the brakes, and worse, that he had his head tilted up and was blatantly watching her in his rearview mirror. She also knew that that particular duplex he was stopped in front of was vacant, so there was no way he was waiting for someone or anything like that. My mum was thoroughly freaked out and trying to figure out what to do at this point, as there were no cell phones back then and thus no one she could call, but there was a nice thick tree up ahead a little, and she realised that if she walked behind it she could then walk away at such an angle that the tree would block his line of vision of her for quite a while, and he wouldn't know exactly where she was. She did this and after getting a decent bit further, she peeped around the blocked line of vision and his car was gone. She figured he realised she was onto him and didn't want to deal with a woman putting up a fight. As I said at the beginning of the post, Ted Bundy was caught two days later in an orange beetle that was stolen two blocks from my parents' apartment. Bundy would apparently often return cars he'd stolen after using them to murder people and my mum thinks that's what he was planning on doing but changed his mind and that's why he was back in the area. So yeah, thankfully my mother was smart and not killed by Ted Bundy and thus I exist. Hooray! not a dog person. This hasn't always been the case though. As a matter of fact, I used to love them. I grew up telling everyone I'd be a veterinarian one day. Had that been the case, I'd like to think I wouldn't be in the position I'm in now. I'm a nervous wreck. As long as I can remember, I've suffered a constant paranoia. If you ask my parents, they tell you an entirely different story. According to them, I was calm, cool, and collected as a child. They say it wasn't until I was around 12 when the way I carried myself drastically changed. I don't remember much from back then. However, there was a particular scene from my childhood that I'll never be able to push out of my mind. Something, or rather someone, that has shouted me for the rest of my life. January 1st, 1994. Remember how I said I wasn't a dog person? Well, there's a reason for that. As I said, I told my parents that I wanted to be a veterinarian. They supported me. They wanted me to be successful. I take for granted how much they cared for me. They bought me books on the animal madden anatomy, they took me to zoos, they bought me various VHS documentaries on animals. They tried their best to raise me into an adult that I wanted to be. The adult my parents could be proud of. My birthday was in November. I was turning 12. My previous attempts of asking my parents for a pet had always ended in an uneventful manner. They would always say I wasn't old enough that I wasn't prepared for the responsibility of looking after a living, breathing animal. I was set to prove them wrong. This year, I was fucking 12. I'd been reading up on all those animal books, and this year I knew I was ready. Once again, I told my parents that I wanted an animal this year. Their reaction was different this time. My father gave me a single maybe, and with that, I knew what I'd be getting for my birthday this year. It was no surprise when I woke up the day of my birthday to a small puppy licking my face. I was thrilled. There, my parents were standing at my bedroom door smiling warmly. They wished me a happy birthday and gave me a speech about how I needed to treat the dog the way I would any other living being. They provided me with a dog, food, bowls, and a leash. In that moment, I was the happiest I'd ever been in my life. The dog was my best friend. The time I spent with the dog was great. I was an only child, homeschooled. 
I was never really able to have interactions with people my age, not that I'd have a problem with doing so. My dog, who I named Theo, had steadily grown a bond with me over the course of a month. We bonded the way any other kid would with his dog. We went on walks, played together, I bathed him, fed him, and overall trying to raise him the best I could, as my parents had done for me. Needless to say, my parents were impressed. Their opinion of me soon changed. It was January 1st, the beginning of a new year and a beginning of a new me. I woke up around 10 a.m., a late start for me. I never actually made it to midnight on New Year's before. I felt like absolute shit. I was greeted in the kitchen by my mother who had provided a delicious breakfast. My mother's cooking was stuff of legend. As I sat at the dining room table to eat breakfast, Theo greeted me from under the table and sat down on my feet. I slipped him a piece of bacon and he was delighted. My breakfast was cut short. One of my chores was to get the mail every day. As soon as I heard the familiar sound of the mail truck, I shot up out of my chair. One of my animal animal documentaries taught me about Ivan Pulvey and his dogs. Funny how I didn't know I was being conditioned to react a certain way to the sound of that truck. I was still tired from last night. I fumbled toward the front door and I wasn't paying much attention. As soon as I opened the door, Theo took off as fast as he could. I couldn't process what just happened. He had never done that before. I collected my thoughts and decided to go after him. I grabbed my jacket from the coat rack and ran outside. As soon as I stepped on my front porch, I froze. Theo hadn't gotten that far. He hadn't even left the front yard. The yard's exit was blocked by a man. That was the first time I saw him. The man looked straight at me. He didn't blink. I didn't know what to do or how to feel. At first I was grateful. He was the only thing standing between Theo and the rest of the world. He said nothing. Theo was looking up at him. He wagged his tail, he panted. It was as if the man didn't notice the dog was there. He just kept staring. I wanted to say something. I wanted to thank him. The way he was looking at me was as if he was expecting me to say something, but I couldn't bring myself to. Without averting his gaze, he kneeled down, picked up Theo by the neck. Theo whined. I wanted to tell him to put my dog down, but again, I couldn't. I simply couldn't think of appropriate words. My mind was all in a jumble. I couldn't move. I couldn't think straight. All I could do was watch. The man reached into his pocket, pulled out a knife, and cut the dog's throat in one quick motion. Blood spilled into a snow-covered ground, and he held the dog in the air for a few seconds, letting Theo's blood form a puddle underneath him. The man then simply let go. Theo fell with a light crunch on the reddened snow. Again, the man's gaze did not leave mine, and he dropped the knife to the ground and merely walked away. It wasn't until he was completely out of sight when I could move again. I made my way over to Theo's groveling corpse and stood over him. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't shed a tear. My mother emerged from the house, and surely wondering why getting the mail was taking so long. I don't blame her for screaming. She saw me standing over a mangled corpse of Theo, knife on the ground. It didn't take its genius to put two and two together. The scene described itself. In the following months, my parents had forced me into seeing a psychiatrist. When I asked why I killed Theo, I tried to tell him it wasn't me. I tried to tell him my best about the man. I could tell he wasn't buying it. All right, said the therapist in a smug tone. Tell me what this man looked like. That's when I realized I couldn't describe him. 
It's not like I didn't remember his face. It's just he was so generic. I wouldn't be able to describe him without describing millions of other people in the world. His face was so forgettable. I know I stared at the man for a good five minutes. One would assume I would be able to remember the face of the man who had killed my dog without breaking eye contact with me. It was like I knew what he looked like, but my brain couldn't translate his appearance into words. I didn't answer the therapist's question. I simply slumped into my chair. Throughout my life, this man had popped up in multiple occasions. I may go further into detail in the future, but all I can say for now is that he definitely exists. I may seem crazy, but I know what I saw that day. I always see him. Whether he's among the crowd while watching the news or in my dreams, he's real and he's always watching. If you are ever driving through Montana, do not stop at a store called Aaron's. If you are ever driving through the eastern part of Montana, do not stop at a store called Aaron's. Let me explain. Two months ago, I was driving from Canada to Missoula in Montana to attend my sister's wedding. She and I had always giggled to each other about marrying some of the athletic boys in high school. Now she was actually going to marry one of them. And I was always reminded of that literally every time I called her about the wedding. Anyway, I wanted to drive alone without my boyfriend so I could see some wilderness that I didn't get to see in Canada without the whining that I know he'll do about taking too long. Of course, the nature I loved at first tended to become stale after the first two hours. And so, my only solace for the next four hours was the taste of sugar snacks that I had packed. But soon I ran out. So I basically needed to stop somewhere to regain my sanity. By the time I was looking to stop, at around 6 a.m., I was in one of those towns. You know, those towns that only have a small selection of really small buildings that are seconds from cracking apart. And the store I decided to stop at to resupply was a little store called Aaron's. It was a tiny old building with blocks of concrete painted white making up the lower half, blocks of concrete painted grey making up the top half, and flimsy iron as a roof. Right next to the parking lot was a beige pole that had a glowing white sign with Aaron's on it in red letters. I wasn't exactly impressed, but I knew these type of places weren't made to be appealing to the eye. They're just to grab something and go, and I planned on doing just that as I walked in. There aren't many words other than dingy I could use to describe the place. It had simple white walls on each side. You could probably see the details and marks on the farthest wall to the back, even when at the front door. I could tell that the store had just recently been occupied by these owners because of all the unpacked boxes wrapped in plastic that were all around the white wall. I could see that a lot of the items they did have for sale were just random stuff. They didn't really have specific sessions for their merchandise, 
they clearly slapped whatever they could find on random shelves. I could also see a tiny bin where the forgotten movies of the 2000s always end up. I wasn't going there, as most wouldn't. I was just looking for some snacks. I went to the counter for some of the chips that they normally had, but they weren't there. Where are you from? said the slightly plump man, with a slight scruff at the end of his chin. Saskatchewan, I told him. Oh, so I guess I should turn on the hockey game for you. He pointed to the tiny TV above him and chuckled. I chuckled along with him at the incredibly original joke. I'm attending a wedding in Masula. Oh, that's nice. I always look forward to seeing lovers come together, he said. So you've been to a lot of weddings? I asked. Yeah. He paused and looked around in a noticeable way. I have a big family, a close family, he said as if he didn't know that I saw him do that. What's your family like? I questioned. Good, we're good people, he said quickly. I became simultaneously suspicious and curious, but I was mostly unwilling to chit-chat anymore. Where are the chips? I asked. They're in the right corner, he said. As I walked away, I turned my hand around a little and saw one millisecond of the man's eyes on my rear before they darted away. I didn't want to partake in the same old, perverted, fat man stereotype, but he was already raising a red flag, so I was ready to get what I wanted and leave. As I made my way over to the chips, I was suddenly met by two little girls. One of them, the taller one, was wearing a purple dress and brown boots and a smaller, younger girl was wearing these cute little pink shoes that showed her tiny white socks. Hello, the tall girl said in a small voice. Hey, I said in a bright voice. My daddy was the manager you just talked to. Really? Yeah, and we just wanted to say that we think you're really pretty. Thank you. I said. My sister thinks so too. The taller girl leaned right into the small girl's face. I could see in those few seconds that her eyes turned blank as she stared. Why don't you tell her? She said in a quieter voice than before, but still very high pitch. You are pretty enough to keep, the smaller one said keep as a pretty present for our uncle. I didn't know what to say. I just stood there with my mouth held open. It made me feel unsafe around these two girls. But I shook it off. Kids say creepy shit all the time. They didn't know what they were saying. I just decided to go pay for the damn chips. I speed walked to the counter and slapped the chips in front of the man. The guy tried to small talk with me again, but I wasn't listening. After that, the two girls came up behind their father. I heard a smaller girl talk to me. You want a cookie? She said. No, I said. Oh, come on, the dad said. She's just trying to be nice. You're being mean, the taller girl yelled at me before she collapsed onto the floor and started whining irritatingly. And right after this, the smaller girl started sobbing. Now look what you've done, the man said while putting his hands on his daughter's shoulders. Just eat a cookie, the dad told me. I didn't want to eat it. After what the girl told me about her uncle, I was suspicious. 
but I didn't want to call this man's relative a kidnapper. Even if he was, I doubt that telling them I knew about it would put me in a good position. Okay, I said. All three of them turned towards me at once as I took the cookie out of the girl's hand. I'll take it with me. Thank you, I said as I mentally planned to chuck that shit out of the window once I drove out of sight. The man got an uneasy expression. He then suddenly turned that expression into a creepy smile. Let's see you eat it, he said. I want him to know how it tastes. I felt... uneasy. Then why haven't you tried them yet? I have. I want to see what you old beavers think of them. He said as he chuckled in a more high-pitched tone than before, as if he was forcing it. I looked down at the cookie. I slowly put it up to my mouth, but eventually I smelled it. I knew it. I had looked up stuff like this before. There is a drug called ketamine that smells like cotton candy, and some doses can render a victim unconscious. My heart started beating. I looked at all three of those people. The taller girl had her head leaned onto the table and was staring at me with wide eyes and a toothy frown of anger. Her dad was also staring at me. He looked like at any moment he was going to jump at me and choke me. I knew there was almost nothing I could do. Then I heard it. From the back room, laughter manic laughter that sounded out through the whole store. It sounded like an old man. In between each laugh I heard coughing, like the old man was choking on phlegm. And then I heard the sounds of something wet hitting the concrete. I jumped as I saw the giant locked doors that went into the back push forward. Oh no, he's woken up, the tall girl said as she dragged the smaller girl with her towards the back door. I was petrified at all of my horrid thoughts of what could be back there. I breathed in and out faster than I ever have before. Then I saw the dad reach into his pocket. I saw a hint of metal and I raced out of the front door. I could hear him yell and swear as I got into my car and went full speed out of there. I didn't tell anybody at the wedding about this incident. I didn't want to damper the happy moment that was helping me recover. But now, the mystery of that place is in my head again. And now I am killing two birds with one stone. I am getting this off my chest and I am warning you to stay away from that store. Stay away. Cup of coffee. OCD is a pretty tricky thing, apparently. Yes. A lot of the time it revolves around a harmless pattern we must repeat throughout the day. Just a daily nuisance that one must learn to integrate into his schedule. It can't possibly have such a drastic effect on your lifestyle, right? It's just time consuming, if anything. So why am I here then? Every time I ask the nurses or the doctors for some sort of explanation they just force a pill in my mouth. I spend most of my day trapped in a restraining jacket in a dinghy room counting their minutes in complete silence. I am sure I am as sane as any of them, but they insist that I require mental treatment. Is all of this necessary just because I have a minor form of obsessive compulsive disorder? A lot of people I know suffer from OCD and I don't see them being labelled as mad. How did they even find out? 
It's not like my obsession is that noticeable or anything, and I haven't really told a lot of people about it. In my case, I just feel the need to reward myself with a cup of hot coffee every time I complete something that I see as significant, like after a hard day of work, for instance. I mean, sure, my caffeine level might be a bit high, but that's hardly a reason for cramming me inside an asylum filled with nutcases. No matter how hard I try to think, I just can't list another reason that might justify me being here. Plus, I have yet to experience any sort of cooperation from the workers here. I do believe that after your home gets stormed by a dozen uniformed men, which are apparently authorised to beat the shit out of you before finally putting on the restraints, you at least deserve a fucking explanation. The bastards didn't even let me finish my coffee. The whole ordeal is a bit fuzzy, probably from having my head bumped against the hood of a police car several times, but I think I recall the important parts. Perhaps you can enlighten me on what the actual hell I did wrong. I believe it was around 6 or 7 p.m., but I might be wrong. I just got home from work, hung my coat in the usual place and tiredly stumbled into the kitchen. I had to fill in for a colleague, so I've been doing double the work. Unfortunately, there were still the mangled bodies laying on the floor from yesterday that needed sawing up. I have a pretty big fridge, but cramming a fully grown human adult in there is pretty impossible, so dismemberment was in order. My daughter and son were already prepared and stuffed in the fridge, but I didn't have time to take care of my wife's and her lover's corpse. My dad's old saw was pretty dull, but it did the job eventually. The bones took a little bit more, as the blade kept getting stuck, but it had to be done and I'm not the type to simply ignore chores. Once I was finished, I stuffed the remains in the fridge next to my children's, mopped the blood and of course plugged in the coffee machine. As you can tell, my OCD doesn't interfere with my work. In fact, it makes me look forward to completing every important piece of business I have on my schedule. I couldn't imagine a better reward for a job well done than a hot cup of my favourite brand of coffee. I even felt like adding some cream, thinking that I deserved it after such an excruciatingly difficult week. As I took a sip, I started to wonder how I was going to spend my weekend. Suddenly, my door was knocked down and the aforementioned morons piled over me, yelling as they kicked and punched me around my own kitchen. One of them was pointing at my fridge, as if he hadn't seen a household appliance in his life. He even started shouting at me about it, but I couldn't determine what he was saying over the loud buzzing in my ears. By the time they got me in the back of the car, I already passed out. Surely I have the rights to press charges for unneeded physical assault, but nobody seems to care for my opinion here. It's been several weeks now since I arrived in the mental institution. Two weeks, three days and twelve hours to be exact, and I don't have much to do besides count. Fortunately, they were kind enough to allow me out of the cell to remove the goddamn jacket, so I can at least wipe my ass like a normal human being. I'm still not allowed around the other inmates though for god knows what reason. My therapist gave me this audio log and told me to record my thoughts, and seeing as I don't have anyone to talk to, I might as well. At least she is alright, and appears as if she wants to help me. Regardless, I want nothing more than to leave this place. I keep telling them that it's just a habit and it doesn't affect me or the people around me in any negative way, but that usually results in me getting more mess pushed into my system. It's just coffee, people. What's the big deal? First time poster, long time lurker. A little information about me. I am an insurance agent in a very small country town. I just moved to a new job with a new insurance company back in November and am still learning how to recognize all the customers and their quirks. I am a very short, chubby female with a lazy eye that I am very sensitive about. The layout of our office is as follows. Important. When you walk in, the front desk is immediately in front of you. To the right is our office manager's office. Behind the front desk is a partition, and behind the partition is another desk. Our main agent's office is hidden away in the back, as is one other office, which is usually where I am. One day, the door alert chimes, and our receptionist greets the person and asks how she can help. I hear a man's voice say, No. Where is he? Well, 
There's only one male employee in the office, and he's busy. So the receptionist pushes to see what he needs and is again told no. Our male co-worker gets off the phone and goes around the partition, asking him to come back to his desk. He proceeds to quote the man for auto insurance. The process takes two hours. The entire time was spent by the man, who will call Mr. Herman, telling my co-worker that he probably has pre-diabetes and sleep apnea because of his weight. Mr. Herman himself must weigh at least 400 pounds and looks like a Santa Claus reject. The smell was the worst part. He smelled like he pissed himself a month ago and never changed his clothes. He eventually accepts the quote after being angry about the price and that we needed basic information like his date of birth and leaves. Should be over, right? No. He has come in many times since then. Each time is a problem that we have made with his bill, i.e., we tried to draft the money and he didn't have it. There was a day my male co-worker was out of the office and I had to deal with him myself about his bill. The conversation went like this. Me. I will go ahead and process this for you. Him. Sweetheart, what happened to your eye? Me. Uh, um, birth defect, sir. Him. I'm a medic, and I know of a really great place that can fix that for you. Me, staring at him dead in the eyes. I like it this way. Before I could get his receipt, his ass bolted out of the office. Oh well. Last night, he came in right before closing, and it was just myself and the office manager. Me. How are you, Mr. Herman? Him. Be better if you weren't canceling my insurance. I reassure him that we are not him. Now, I'll be better if you can find me a three-year-old's blood to drink. I didn't say anything. He then proceeds to tell me about a blood transfusion project with rats and the Fountain of Youth. I noped the fuck out of there and went home to hug my three-year-old daughter for hours. So, creepy, piss-smelling cannibal man, let's not meet.